Good afternoon. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Q1 2024 Cooper Companies Earnings Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, please press the star one. I would now like to turn the conference over to Kim Duncan, VP of Investor Relations and Risk Management. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and welcome to Cooper Company's first quarter 2024 earnings conference call. During today's call, we will discuss the results and guidance included in the earnings release, and then use the remaining time for questions. Our presenters on today's call are Al White, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Brian Andrews, Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this conference call contains forward-looking statements, including revenues, EPS, operating income, tax rate, FX, and other financial guidance and expectations, strategic and operational initiatives, market and regulatory conditions and trends, and product launches and demand. Forward-looking statements depend on assumptions, data, or methods that may be incorrect or imprecise and are subject to risks and uncertainties, events that could cause our actual results and future actions of the company to differ materially from those described in forward-looking statements, are set forth under the caption, Forward-looking Statements, in today's earnings release, and are described in our SEC filings, including Cooper's Form 10-K and Form 10-Q filings, all of which are available on our website at coopercodes.com. Also, as a reminder, the non-GAAP financial information we will provide on this call is provided as a supplement to our GAAP information. We encourage you to consider our results under GAAP as well as non-GAAP and refer to the reconciliations provided in our earnings release, which is available on the Investor Relations section of our website. Should you have any additional questions following the call, please email ir at cooperco.com. And now I'll turn the call over to Al for his opening remarks. Great. Thank you, Kim, and welcome, everyone, to Cooper Company's 2024 Fiscal First Quarter Conference Call. We're off to an outstanding start this year, posting all-time record quarterly revenues of $932 million. Cooper Vision started the year on a solid note, growing nicely around the world, and Cooper Surgical achieved record quarterly revenues, with our fertility business posting its 13th consecutive quarter of double-digit organic growth. Our earnings were strong, and our momentum is excellent, with capacity expansion progressing well and demand remaining very healthy. Moving to the quarterly numbers and reporting all percentages on an organic basis, consolidated revenues were $932 million, up 8% year-over-year. Cooper Vision posted revenues of $622 million, up 7%, led by strength in our daily silicone hydrogel portfolio. And Cooper Surgical posted revenues of $310 million, up 8%, led by another great quarter in our fertility business. Margins improved and profits were solid with non-GAAP earnings per share of $0.85, cents, remembering that we just completed a four-for-one stock split last week. For Cooper Vision, the Americas grew 6%, EMEA 10%, and Asia Pac 7%. All three regions reported success with our innovative product portfolios, market-leading flexibility, and growth in key accounts. Within modalities, our daily silicone hydrogel lenses, My Day and Clarity, grew 14%, and our silicone hydrogel monthly and two-week lenses, Biofinity and Avera Vitality, grew 6%. We're continuing to see outsized demand, especially for My Day, but our capacity is improving, and this is reflected in our higher revenue guidance that we'll cover shortly. Turning to products, we're seeing very strong growth in demand with MyDay. Starting with MyDay Multifocal, our momentum is truly fantastic. The unique combination of an advanced multifocal design paired with an easy fitting system is resulting in 98% of patients being fit in two pairs or less. And patient feedback continues to be outstanding, including my own. As many of you know, I wear these lenses and they're amazing. Whether I'm looking at a screen for long hours, driving home, eating out, or doing anything else, my vision is crisp and my eyes feel great. I'm comfortable saying these are the best multifocals in the market, and our outstanding growth and strong demand certainly supports that. Moving to My Day Torque, this lens is also performing extremely well. The rollout of our parameter expansion across North America and Europe has been a tremendous success, and we look forward to increasing availability as capacity improves. 
Demand for the product continues to be driven by our market-leading torque design, which mirrors Biofinity's design, and our industry-leading SKU range, which is by far the widest torque range in the daily market. In our, in, in our MyDay Sphere portfolio, MyDay Energis is approaching its one-year anniversary in the U.S. market and is continuing to generate great results. Its innovative digital boost technology delivers optics designed for today's lifestyle, where on average people spend more than seven hours per day on screens, and wearers love it. Meanwhile, our premium MyDay Sphere is also posting great results. To wrap up on my day, our team has done a phenomenal job supplying existing customers while keeping expectations in check on new product launches and geographic expansion. I'm now happy to report that our success expanding capacity is easing some of those constraints and allowing us to be more active moving forward. Moving to Clarity, with its full family of silicone hydrogel spheres, torx, and multifocals, we're continuing to do well. The comfort, ease of handling, and price positioning have led Clarity to be a lens of choice for many new wearers. Outside of dailies, demand for Biofinity remains strong, led by Torx and multifocals. It's worth highlighting our Biofinity Torx multifocal, which is growing very nicely as eye care practitioners continue making it their primary lens for patients experiencing more complex vision needs, balancing presbyopia with differing levels of astigmatism. We'll be expanding availability of this lens in existing markets and launching a new market soon, so we're excited about that. Avera, Avera also had a nice quarter led by Torx. Moving to myopia management, we posted revenues at 29 million, up 19%, with MySight up 51%. This was another excellent quarter for MySight, powered by growth across all regions, with particular strength in EMEA, where we posted record quarterly sales. Worldwide, we're continuing to see momentum in key accounts, high retention rates, and a nice halo effect. We're also launching new digital tools and programs to streamline the fitting process, making it easier and quicker. My site remains the first and only FDA-approved contact lens for myopia control, and it's backed by extensive clinical data and real-world results. This is a critical differentiator as the proactive management of myopia becomes standard of care within the eye care community to help reduce the progression of myopia in children. Outside of my site, our Ortho-K lenses declined 10% due to weakness in China. And on Cyclass, you may have heard from our JV partner, Essilor Luxotica, that the FDA recently granted Cyclass Spectacles breakthrough device designation. We're excited about this update and we'll continue working closely with the FDA in hopes of obtaining approval in the second half of 2025. Finally, as we look to expand myopia care to all children, we've launched a pilot program in the U.S. called Generation Sight in collaboration with three top optometry schools, the Illinois College of Optometry, the New England College of Optometry, and the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences to provide myopia care to underserved children. This program engages local public school systems to drive awareness and treatment of myopia by providing free eye exams and free MySight. It also helps optometry students get real-world pediatric experience while increasing their clinical capabilities as they develop into the next generation of professional leaders. As a leader in the myopia management space, we're certainly proud of programs like this that are making a difference with kids in our communities. To finish on Cooper Vision, the contact lens market grew 9% in calendar 2023, with Cooper Vision taking share growing 11%. We expect 2024 to be another strong year, supported by the long-term macro growth trend and more people needing vision correction. It's estimated that 50% of the global population will have myopia by the year 2050, up from roughly 34% today. When you combine this with the ongoing shift to silicone hydrogel dailies, the increasing focus on higher value products and higher pricing, we expect many years of solid growth for the industry. Within this, we expect to remain a leader with our innovation, robust product portfolio, ongoing product launches, strength and premium torque and multifocal products, fast-growing myopia management business, and leading new fit data. Moving to Cooper Surgical, we posted record quarterly revenues of $310 million, up 8% organically. Fertility sales were $119 million, up 11% which is our 13th consecutive quarter of double-digit organic growth. This success was driven by our outstanding team and market-leading products and services within consumables, capital equipment, and reproductive genetic testing. We're also investing for the future. 
opening new donor sites, providing extensive training in our centers of excellence, expanding geographically, and accelerating innovation. We believe our focus on investing and delivering the most innovative and advanced solutions to fertility clinics and patients remains unmatched. This includes our recent launch of Witness IQ, a cloud-based digital platform that further enhances the benefits of the Witness system to track activity, reduce errors, and improve efficiencies in fertility labs. And we remain at the forefront of fertility-based genetic testing. Cooper Surgical was an early adopter of artificial intelligence to identify the best embryos to transfer during an IVF cycle, and we're now further advancing our leadership position with a launch of primary template-directed amplification, a new approach to DNA amplification for embryo biopsy samples. As an enhancement to the existing pre-implementation genetic testing process, this technology better identifies genetic anomalies in a faster, more accurate manner. This is the first major advancement to DNA amplification in embryo since 2009 and will help drive better patient outcomes. Delivering these types of innovations is why we're a leader in this space and it's our commitment to continue this type of work. For the global fertility market, the trends supporting significant long-term growth remain intact, including women delaying childbirth, increasing patient awareness, greater benefits coverage, technology advancements that improve success rates, and broadly speaking, improving access to treatment. The World Health Organization highlights that one in six people globally will be, infect will be affected by infertility at some point in their lives. So this is an issue that impacts a lot of people and will continue to do so in the future. As part of this, we remain incredibly committed to the fertility industry and will always stand in support of patients and clinics. Access to fertility treatment is incredibly important for so many people, and Cooper will continue to advocate for increased accessibility and the advancement of human reproductive rights on a global basis. Moving to office in Surgical, we posted sales of $191 million, up 6% organically, with medical devices growing 6%, stem cell storage up 4%, and Paragard up 7%. Within our medical device business, we reported strength in our labor and delivery portfolio, including the Cook products that we acquired last November that grew 13%. We also reported strength in our minimally invasive gynecological surgery products, which include market-leading disposables and innovative capital, such as our Ally Uterine Manipulator portfolio. Our stem cell business had a solid quarter, and Paragard outperformed expectations with outstanding execution around a mid-single-digit price increase. To conclude on Cooper Surgical, we take great pride in being able to say that every minute, somewhere around the world, a baby is born using Cooper Surgical products. We're making a difference in people's lives, and that's a big part of what makes this business special for us. Before turning the call over to Brian, let me say that in addition to our strong operational performance, our efforts around environmental sustainability, corporate social responsibility, and other important areas within our business are also advancing well. So thank you to our 15,000 plus employees around the world for their hard work and dedication as they drive our success. And now I'll turn the call over to Brian. Thank you, Al, and good afternoon, everyone. Most of my commentary will be on a non-GAAP basis, so please refer to our earnings release for a reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP results. For the first quarter, consolidated revenues were 932 million, up 9% as reported, and up 8% organically. Consolidated gross margin was 67.3%, up from 65.7% last year, driven by efficiency gains in price at both Cooper Vision and Cooper Surgical. Operating expenses grew 8%, improving to 43% of revenues as we continued leveraging prior SG&A investment activity. Consolidated operating margin improved to 24.4%, up from 22.6%, led by the gross margin improvement in SG&A leverage. Below operating income, interest expense was 28.6 million, and the effective tax rate was lower than expected at 13.3% due to stock option exercises. Non-GAAP EPS was 85 cents, up 18%, with roughly 200 million average shares outstanding. The impact from FX was three cents negative, year over year for the quarter. Free cash flow was 5 million with CapEx of 118 million. As discussed on prior calls, free cash flow continues to be impacted 
as we progress with our capacity expansion projects. Net debt increased to $2.6 billion due to the closing, due to closing the Cook medical acquisition in November. To summarize fiscal Q1, this was an excellent start to the year. Cooper Vision and Cooper Surgical both posted strong results, and we expect this to continue. We remain focused on exceptional operational execution combined with high return investment activities, such as increasing capacity and expanding geographically, and we're confident this will drive significant long-term shareholder value. Moving to fiscal 2024 guidance, we're increasing expectations for revenues and earnings by incorporating our Q1 B, better future operational performance, and slightly lower interest expense. This results in full year consolidated revenues of 3.85 to 3.9 billion, up 7 to 8% organically. For Cooper Vision, we expect strong results to be driven by healthy demand and improving capacity. This translates to an increase in our organic revenue guidance to 8 to 9%, which equates to 2.57 to $2.6 billion. For Cooper Surgical, we expect continuing strength in fertility along with solid performance in our office and surgical product category. This translates to an increase in our organic revenue guidance to 5 to 7%, which equates to 1.27 to 1.29 billion. We're increasing our non-GAAP EPS guidance to an expected range of $3.50 to $3.58, up 9 to 12% year over year or up 15 to 17% in constant currency. This guidance assumes roughly $108 million of interest expense, which includes no interest rate changes by the Fed during the remainder of our fiscal year. For tax, we're expecting a full year effective tax rate of roughly 14.5% by incorporating Q1 and assuming no additional discrete items. For currency, rates are very similar to our initial annual guidance. Thus, the impact to Q2 to Q4 is essentially unchanged. And the full year impact is still roughly a negative 1% to revenues and a negative 5% to earnings. To wrap up, we had an excellent fiscal Q1 and the business is trending well. We're leveraging our prior investment activity, advancing our production efforts, and investing to drive continued growth. Demand and momentum are strong, and that's reflected in our updated guidance. And with that, I'll hand it back to the operator for questions. The floor is now open for your questions. So to ask a question at this time, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. For this Q&A, you'll be provided the opportunity to ask one question and one further follow-up question. For now, we'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Craig Biju with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Good, good afternoon, and uh, congrats on, uh, on a good start to your to your twenty uh, twenty four. So um, I, maybe I, I guess you know maybe just start with you know some of the backdrop on the overall contact lens market. Uh, obviously, you know still still pretty pretty strong. Um, you know I heard your comments, Al, on on the growth of the market, but love to hear. Uh, a little bit about pricing, volume trends, and just you know, kind of the transition to to daily, um, and uh, just you know where you guys are with your supply and how you can capitalize on on that. Uh, sure, yeah, uh, absolutely, cover that. Um, several comments, I guess, as we think about it. Um, you're correct. The contact lens market is strong right now, um, and it doesn't show any indications of slowing down. Um, so we're, we're, we as an industry are in pretty good shape. Um, when you look at pricing and volume trends and the transition to dailies, I mean, those are the hot points that are driving the market. 
And it does go back really to the to the transition to dailies. I mean, that's one of the biggest drivers as, as the market continues to shift to dailies away from the two week and monthly modalities. That's driving growth of the overall marketplace. And that's continuing to happen. And it has just many, many years, I think, in front of us. Uh, from a pricing perspective, you're continuing to see positive pricing. Uh, we saw that through the price increases in Q1. Um, I, I think you're, frankly, going to continue to see price increases as we move forward, given where the market is right now. Um, volume trends, you know, when you think about it, if, if you take that in terms of wearers, we are seeing um, wearers increase. The number of wearers around the world is increasing at a, at a modest pace, kind of as it does consistently. So you have that kind of underlying the growth. But then that transition to dailies and pricing being a big component of it. The other thing that I want to mention there is the growth in Torx and multifocals. You're, you're seeing, you obviously see that in our numbers because we report it. But as a market, you're seeing a lot of growth in Torx and multifocals. Those are higher priced products that are doing really well. Um, and they're going to continue to grow because they're in, underpenetrated throughout the world. Uh, so you have a lot of potential for future growth in, in Torx multifocals. And when I roll that into dailies and we talk about what's hitting the marketplace now with daily Torx, daily multifocals, um, that supports even more so the, the kind of strong market growth that's out there. Uh, from a supply perspective, we're in a much better spot than we were um, when we were talking to start this year. Uh, we made a lot of progress. My hat's off to the team. We have a fantastic manufacturing team within Cooper Vision. Um, and they've made some tremendous uh, progress over the last quarter. So we're in a much better position to be able to, uh, to support our existing customer base and also be able to launch products, um, new products, and geographic expansion. Got it. Thanks, Alan. If I could just follow up on, on the fertility environment, and obviously you guys had pretty strong growth, um, again, you know, double digits. Um, obviously, there's a lot of headlines around uh, IVF, fertility, um, and, and, you know, I, some companies calling or pointing out that benefits may be getting pushed. So I guess I just wanted to ask you, you know, the benefit environment and, you know, it sounds like the overall environment for fertility is still very strong, you know, strong trends. Um, but any reason to think that you can't continue to do the double-digit um, double digit growth? Um, you're right. Uh, fertility is getting a lot of headlines. Um, now, that's largely a U.S.-based thing because it's tied to Alabama and the court ruling. Um, I won't kind of get on my high horse, if you will, with my frustration about what's going on there. But um, obviously, as a big player, we support fertility and all the patients and all the fertility clinics out there, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so there's some commentary that's out there more in the U.S. market than anywhere else around the world. So um, when I look at the global fertility market and how we're doing, I would only put so much weight on that because I think at the end of the day, the fertility markets can continue to be really strong. And um, we'll see how we do quarter to quarter, but... Uh, um, we're going to continue to post double-digit growth for a number of years, I believe. Um, the, mar the underlying characteristics of that market are just too strong um, and are going to support too much growth for, for many years in front of us. Great. Thanks for taking the questions. Yep. Our next question comes from the line of Larry Pickleson with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. I'll echo uh, my congratulations on the quarter here. Hey, um, Al and Brian, I actually wanted to start with margins and then one on CSI. So, so Brian, the gross and operating margin were up nicely in Q1. How, how do we think about the gross margin and operating margin uh, for, for fiscal 2024 and the phasing? Uh, it seems like we could see upside to the margins based on what's implied um, in the guidance uh, from, from what I can tell. Hi, Larry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you know, our, our, the story is, is largely pretty similar to the, to the commentary we provided last quarter. Um, you know, outside of the FX piece, which is negative to us, and on revenues and EPS and so OI, frankly, uh, and cost of goods, um, you know, we're still holding gross margins pretty similar to last year. So, you know, it'll be, it depend a little bit on product mix as you work through the year. It'll bounce around a little bit, but I'd expect that we'll land somewhere in the neighborhood of where we ended last year on an as-reported basis from a gross margin perspective. 
um, operating margin, um, you know, we've we've taken up our implied constant currency OI growth to 14 to 17%. So we're effectively increasing our operating margin a touch from where we were, uh, where we had guided last quarter. Um, but yeah, I would expect operating margins to be up uh, on an as reported uh, basis year over year, uh, but quite a bit more on a constant currency basis. Um, and from a gating perspective, I wouldn't really point out anything in particular outside of the fact that, you know, FX, as we've been telling people last quarter, is a bit more of a negative uh, in, uh, in, in Q2, um, which is uh, our, our worst FX quarter, and so it's going to impact us a little bit there. That's helpful. And Al, to follow up on uh, Craig's question on CSI, you know, you grew 8% in Q1 organically. You're guiding to 5 to 7 so, so why does growth slow? Are you assuming some slowdown in IVF, or are you assuming um, you know, uh, new competition to Paragard? And, and, and talk about that, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, we'll see how fertility does um, on a quarterly basis, right? I mean, underlying, the underlying factors that drive fertility are continuing to be strong, and uh, I believe we're going to continue to put up strong fertility growth moving forward. Um, when it comes to uh, the growth of 5 to 7%, uh, you are correct, right? I would still say even with the strength of Paragard in Q1, and by the way, I think we're going to have a good quarter with Paragard in Q2, um, I would still kind of guide people to say, hey, that's going to be roughly flat on a year-over-year -year basis um, due to, to vo ultimate volume demand and maybe some competitive entrance into that market. Now, maybe that doesn't happen, and you'll get some upside from that. So you could argue there's a little bit of conservatism in that number, but um, uh, after one quarter, I think taking it from four to six up to five to seven is probably enough, and, and hopefully we're able to, to certainly meet that, if not beat that. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jeff Johnson with Baird. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, good afternoon, and congratulations on the quarter. So, Al, maybe a similar question as, as Larry just asked on CSI, but for CBI, you're taking that up 100 basis points uh, for the year. You know, this first quarter came in right exactly where you guided, right at the 7%, so it does imply an acceleration uh, over the back half. So with 1Q being where you expected, you know, what gives you the confidence to raise this early in the year uh, to, to faster growth over the next few quarters, number one? And, and number two, I think last quarter you talked about potentially hitting double digits with CVI in the back three quarters of the year after this first capacity constrained quarter. Do you still have the confidence in that, uh, you know, potentially getting to the double digit CVI the rest of this year? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, great question, Jeff. Um, well, in Q1, we did 7%. It was a strong 7%. I mean, we almost got ourselves to round up to 8%. So a good solid Q1 to start the year off. Um, I do think we'll get ourselves back to double digit. As a matter of fact, I think we've got a, a good chance to get to double digit right away here in Q2. So um, when I look at kind of where we sit today, how we did in Q1, how we closed the quarter out, how February is going, um, improvements in our capacity that we have that's going to allow us a little bit more flexibility, yeah, I feel comfortable taking that 7 to 9 up to 8 to 9. Um, and we'll see how it goes, um, you know, as we move through the year. Yeah, fair enough. And then, Brian, if I could ask a, a clarifying question on the gross margin commentary you made. You know, you were up 100 and, what was it, 160 basis points year over year in the first quarter. You're now talking kind of flattish for the year. It implies somewhere around 50 basis points down year over year each of the next three quarters, or maybe it doesn't gate out perfectly even like that. But, uh, you know, is that just simply because currency was plus 100 basis points year over year in the first quarter, and it looks like in the second and third quarter it's going to swing back to a negative? Is that just purely currency? Is there something else in there that would get the gross margin from up so nicely in FQ1 year over year to down, you know, a decent amount year over year, the balance of the year? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Jeff. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, currency in the first quarter wasn't as, as impactful as uh, as the latter part of the year, certainly Q2 and Q3 are are worse from a from a, an operating profit or a gross profit perspective. Um, outside of that, um, you know, I wouldn't really point to anything in particular. I would say Q1 kind of landed about where we expected. Um, you know, some of it's a little bit of timing, but I would say in general, you know, we're expecting on an as reported basis pretty similar gross margins as we work through the, through the year.
Our next question comes from the line of Joanne Winch, CD Group. Please go ahead. Um, thank you for taking the question. And nice quarter. Um, mechanically, is there a reason you've consolidated the way that you're reporting some of the revenue for crew provision? And part of that, where now am I going to see um, my site? Uh, so you'll see my site in Sphere. Um, is where we'll report that. Um, and we consolidated it ultimately because I think it's just a better representation of how we look at the business um, combined with uh, competitive dynamics. And that's, that was really okay. the reason behind it. Yeah. And my sort of second follow-up question has to do with site glass. What are the steps now to bringing that to market? And can you please remind us of how the JV shows up on your income statement? Thank you. Yep, sure. So for site glass, most of the JV shows up below the line, below operating income. It's, um, it's a loss, as you can imagine, right now as we continue to invest in it. Um, so we just run that through our P&L. Um, and that's the way it'll be moving forward, it, it, other than um, if all goes well, that'll turn, obviously, to a profit, and we'll report that below the line. Uh, the process right now is, without getting into too much detail, is really to continue to work with the FDA. There's some spots, especially among younger children, where we have some really strong clinical data. Um, so to continue w with the FDA, uh, meet the requirements that they're looking for, and um, uh, work hard here to get uh, approval for that product, uh, FDA approval for that product in the back half of uh, next year. In the meantime, we're selling that in multiple markets around the world, including in China, and we're getting some great feedback on it. Thank you very much. Yep. Our next question comes from the line of Anthony Petron with Mizuno Group. Please. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, and uh, congrats again uh, on a quarter here. Maybe one just on on lens capacity, and and Brian, we spoke about this a little bit uh, earlier this year. Just just where are you on the build out, and and maybe to clarify, like how much demand is actually being left out there? Like how much are you not getting because Cooper is a bit supply constrained, and then. You know, follow up on myopia management, just maybe a, a reset on the TAM opportunity of the combined bundle when we think of site glass with my site, just, just kind of a high-level recap of what the overall market opportunity is for those two products combined. Thanks. Sure. Um, good questions. On uh, lens capacity, yeah, I, I think um, – you know, demand is strong. It's going to continue to be strong because you're continuing to get wearers that are going in, whether it's a new wearer or an existing wearer, uh, moving themselves to dailies and moving into Torx and multifocals. So you're going to have that demand. I believe that underlying demand for years and years and years and years and years, and years in front of us. Um, the position that we're in today from a capacity perspective is allowing us to meet a lot of that demand, not all of it, but a lot of that demand. As I mentioned earlier, I think um, may have been Jeff asking about it, right? We're in a good enough spot here where we're going to be able to, I believe, even return to double-digit growth here in Q2, but certainly put us in a position where we're going to be able to post strong numbers. So um, that's how I'd answer that right now, and I think that with capacity continuing to come on, it's going to put us in position to have, frankly, um, strong years for a number of years in front of us. If I look at the myopia management market, um, boy, uh, that's, that's crazy exciting. Um, it's taking a while to develop. Uh, we obviously thought it would move along a little bit faster, but when I look at what's going on in the marketplace right now with glasses, um, there's some fantastic products out there, and Sight Glass is one of those that's making its way into the marketplace, and the feedback is excellent. Um, my site's doing really well. We're seeing some really good momentum with my site in Europe and some other markets. Um, it's a little difficult to get to a TAM, but we're certainly talking about uh, a marketplace that's going to be in the billions of dollars. It, it's very large, and, and it's almost every month we see a society somewhere coming out and pushing myopia management and just saying, hey, this needs to become standard of care. I think the U.K. was the most recent one. Um, coming out and saying to optometrists, this needs to be standard of care. And it does. We need to proactively tr treat children. It's crazy uh, that we don't to the degree that uh, we should. And, and frankly, you have one and only FDA-approved product with 
um, with my side right now, which is which is great. But we need the glasses to come along with that, and, and I'm happy to say that the industry is making a lot of progress there. So big opportunity still in front of us. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. Our next question comes from the line of Jason Becker with Viper Sandler. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Nice quarter, guys. Um, Al wanted to start, you know, in past calls, I think we've heard about your position, uh, maybe from like a new fit perspective. Uh, just, would, you know, would love to hear what you're seeing out there in, in the data on dailies or daily thigh highs, uh, torques, multifocals, just, you know, you know really where you're, uh, where you're punching, punching pretty well right now. Um, just any yep. insight on where your share stands on the new fit side, um, and again, maybe in the context of your current market share in those categories. Yeah, um, as a general answer, I would say that our fit data is certainly in front of what our current market share is, uh, and that's that's a good sign, right? And we've been running that way for a little while here, and we're continuing to run that way. Um, the only caveat I would put on that, or asterisk, if you will, is sometimes it's hard to get that data all around the world. We get that through GFK and a few other sources, um, but I'm I'm comfortable continuing to say that our our fit data is in excess of our market share, um, which is a really good sign for us. Okay. I, I mean, maybe one follow-up there and then a separate one, but are, you, are there any of those categories where you'd say you're maybe you know, outsized share gains just as we think about you know, how, you know, where the revenue growth or the accelerated revenue growth is going to come from, um, you know, as we look out over the next several quarters? And then I, sure. I think you also mentioned, you know, key account strategy wins just across all geographies. You know, any more mm -hmm. color you can add there, you know, and maybe latest update on that strategy and how pricing is trending in that category? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, as we look forward here, where you're going to see growth is is going to continue to be what you've seen, meaning we're going to do well in torques and multifocals. We have a great position in uh, those categories and uh, leadership position, right? We do really well. I think you're going to continue to see strong numbers there. Um, the other place that you'll see strong numbers where we're doing well from a fit perspective is in the daily silicone hydrogel side of things. Um, now, that would include some torques and multifocals, but also on the spear side. Um, so that's that's where we have strength. You know, if you, if you look at legacy hydrogels um, and some of that kind of stuff, right, There's we certainly have weakness in those areas, but um, our fit data and our strength is in the direction that the market's moving. So that's a great sign. Um, within key accounts, yeah, we're doing well within key accounts. What I highlighted in the script, which, um, which I'm excited to talk about, is kind of key, out, key account activity within my site. Um, the, pro the progression with my site has started with independent optometrists where we did well and we've been growing. Right, but we started to get some of our key accounts more interested in the product and starting to roll it out throughout their franchises. They need to figure out how they're going to sell that, standardize it throughout the franchise, how they're going to price it, um, all the activity that goes around creating a new myopia management or myopia control infrastructure, if you will. That work is being done, and we're seeing progress on that. It's just it's just solid, consistent progress. Right, that's why we did what, 50%, a little over 50% growth this quarter. And I think you're going to continue to see that from my side, just plugging away at kind of 50%, something like that, you know, 45, 50, 55% kind of growth on a consistent basis. That's being driven by underlying strength in those key accounts. Whereas, you know, Jason, right, we have a good relationship with a lot of them through the store brands and so forth right now. So expanding that relationship uh, to include my site. All right, very helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Patrick Wood with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Amazing. Thank you. Um, on the Torx side, I'm just kind of curious, you know, it's like astigmatism is probably like a third of uh, a third of the population. So I'm just curious from the data that you guys have, do you have a good sense of like from an RX perspective where we are on the lenses, i.e., you know, how underpenetrated that category is in kind of totality? Oh yeah, uh, it's way under penetrated. So um, I don't I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but I would tell you it's definitely under penetrated in the U.S. market, and the U.S. market is by far the most penetrated, and it's still solidly under penetrated. Uh, when you go outside of the U.S., it's it would be way under penetrated. Um, and to your point, you're starting to see the fitting 
of patients who have an astigmatism has improved over the years, and it's much easier to fit a product, um, a Toric product. And by the way, the quality of those products has continued to improve. A My Day Toric is just a fantastic product. It fits well. It's very stable. Um, patients really like it. So uh, um, that's a great question. I should dig into the details. I mean, I can just tell you it's significantly underpenetrated. <laughs> there's, you know, I could just, off the top of my head, I could tell you there's 10 plus years of significant growth that's going to come out of the toric market as it continues to grow around the world. And as eye care practitioners can continue to fit the, the correct lens um, for every single patient who comes in looking for the optimal visual correction. Totally makes makes sense. Uh, I, I, I'm astigmatic as well, so I kind of I get it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then maybe yeah. uh, maybe on the Europe side, like that was that was a big number within CBI, and and you gave some color there. Um, was there anything in particular? I know you had some of the bigger contracts that were rolling over on that side of things, but dynamics in Europe. Very curious about that as well. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, good, strong number in Europe. I think we're going to continue to have them. Um, we have a, a, just a fantastic team there. Uh, our commercial team is just uh, killing it, and they have for a number of years. Uh, so I think when you combine the strength of our team over there, uh, the rollout of products, we're going to get some new products in there. We're going to expand some of the products that we currently have, put ourselves in a better position to sell. Um, yeah, we're having strength right there um, right now with key accounts and so forth. Um, uh, as product availability capacity improves, I think you're going to continue to see success there. Couldn't be happier with it, what our European team is doing. Brilliant. Thanks for taking the questions. Yep. Our next question comes from the line of Ravi Marcus with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Oh, great. I uh, appreciate it. And I'll add uh, congrats on a good quarter. Um, maybe, maybe to start, I know there's uh, some regulations coming out in April for the lab uh, developed tests. Wanted to see what your exposure to that was and um, any implications in your view. Uh, I'm kind of raising my eyebrow, not sure what you're referring to, which means that's probably a really good sign because it wouldn't be applicable to us. <laughs> Got it. Um, I think it's in some of your filings. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll circle back. Um, maybe, maybe just to touch on um, myopia management. You know, it was down quarter over quarter. You talked about down 10% in China and ortho K. Just maybe yeah. speak to the uh, the ortho K market uh, globally and in China specifically, and and your view there, both uh, on a underlying basis and uh, competitive. Thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, yeah, we had Ortho K growth around the world, uh, so our team continues to do well with Ortho K. Uh, but within China, it's very bumpy. I mean, we grew what um, thirty upper thirty percent, thirty nine or something like that in Q four, and down ten here. So it's pretty bumpy. And whether that's channel fill or some other activity that's happening in China. Um, that China is, I, I believe, going to continue to be bumpy for us. Now, we're, that's not a huge market for us, as you know, so I'm not going to claim to be an expert in China, uh, but we, we are seeing some volatility with respect to the ortho K market and certainly within China. Um, I would kind of split that from my site, right? And maybe that's one of the reasons you're seeing a little volatility in ortho K is because of the strength that we're seeing in my site as that continues to improve. Um, but um, I would probably say, yeah, my site really strong, maintaining strong. Ortho K is still going to grow for the year, and it's still going to do fine for the year, but uh, it's going to be choppy. Great. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Our next question comes from the line of Chris Puscali with Nefron. Please go ahead. Thanks. Al, on the last call, I think you talked about 5 to 7% contact lens market growth in calendar 24 was the underlying expectation embedded in the guidance. Is that still your expectation, or do you think it will be better than that? Um, I guess I would probably stick with the 5 to 7 right now, but I would uh, certainly lean towards the upper end of that. Okay. And then how are you thinking about how my site and site glass fit together in the myopia market longer term? Do spectacles become first line therapy and contacts are reserved for older patients or is it is it not that clean? Just trying to get a sense for how additive um, you know the addition of spectacles in, in markets like the US could be versus cannibalistic of what you've got going on already. 
Uh, yeah, that's really an interesting one. Spectacles are going to become the first line, if you will, because um, when a child walks in the door, and we're talking about children, right, so five years old up to 13, 14 years old, the easiest fit by far for the optometrist is to put them in glasses. Um, and I think that that's really going to push the myopia management market forward because every single optometrist will be able to fit a child in glasses and get them out the door. And I don't know why you wouldn't do that. It'd be almost malpractice not to put somebody in glasses and treat their myopia progression. Um, but what you're going to have off that is a, is a couple of things. One is you're going to have what happens in the, the normal world, which is people want to wear contact lenses. And whether that's for uh, sports or some sort of activity or whether that's for looks, you're going to have people wanting to wear contact lenses. And that's what's going to happen in that space. The add-on to that, though, is going to be compliance. Because in order for that treatment, and it's a treatment to be successful, the child has to wear their glasses. And they have to wear them a lot. If the child's not wearing them, when they're going in for their annual appointment, they're going to, the optometrist is going to be able to tell. It's going to be the same thing with Invisalign, right? And if you're not wearing it, you're not getting the value of the treatment. The optometrist is going to be able to see and talk to the parents and say, hey, your child has these myopia control glasses, but they're not wearing them enough, and I can see the progression of the myopia. We have to get them into contact lenses so they're getting the full value of that treatment. So I think you're going to have a higher uh, rate of penetration of contact lenses within the myopia control business than you do within contact lenses in general. Thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Steve Lickman with Oppenheimer & Company. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, congrats on the quarter. Um, I guess, um, Brian, you know, you've, you're obviously investing behind uh, capacity expansion. So how should we think about CapEx levels and, and free cash flow this year? Uh, and do you expect CapEx as a percent of sales to go higher in the coming years as you maybe try to stay ahead of demand? Hi, Steve. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess the way I'd say is, you know, we, we talked about free cash flow last quarter being up versus last year, probably about uh, $100 million this year. Um, you know, I would say that the first half of the year is, is we're going to see sort of Similar kind of free cash flow numbers as we saw, you know, in Q1 and Q2, and then I'll, and then I would expect will inflect nicely in Q3 and Q4. So cash flow conversion will be improved. Um, you know, I'd say as a percentage of, of revenues, uh, this is going to be kind of a, a I would call it a high. I mean, it's, it should be pretty similar to last year um, on a percentage basis. Uh, but uh, as we look at next year and the years thereafter, I would expect it to come down on a percentage basis. Okay, got it. And then just to follow up on, on Cyclabs, appreciate the update there. Um, do you expect the investments behind Cyclabs in the near term to go up to support approval, or do they go down for a bit given the, the sort of the later approval expectations? Understanding it's below the line, just curious on that. Thanks. Um, well, I think we'll continue to invest as we are now. Once we get uh, FDA approval, we'll work with uh, Essilor Luxottica, have conversations about the best way to launch that and how to capitalize on um, on the FDA approval. So we'll continue to spend on it right now, um, supporting that product and launches around the world and things we're trying to accomplish, including the clinical work and so forth that we're trying to do. And then uh, we'll determine the best path forward, hopefully, when we get uh, the FDA approval kind of in the back half of uh, – next year and that that would be a really exciting thing and and really open the doors to uh, a pretty significant market for us so uh, we'll have to have the conversations and, and see where we go then got it thanks Al yep. our next question comes from the line of Brett Fishman with Key Bank Capital Markets please go ahead hey guys thanks so much for taking the questions here just had a couple quick ones on pricing. Um, one, just in the context of the full year CVI guide of eight to nine percent, do you have a directional sense of how much of that is getting driven by price? And then as a follow up, just curious, because I, I know you guys are playing a little bit of catch up this year relative to the market. 
um, how the consumer is accepting some of the price changes this year, and if you think going forward there might be a little bit more room for some continued catch-up activity relative to the industry. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see on future price increases as to um, how the economy continues to move. Uh, as of date, we're, we're not seeing significant pushback, but um, a lot of the growth of the industry, remember, continues to be moved to daily. So um, a lot of that is a product mix trade-up, which includes higher price embedded within it, if that makes sense. Um, so as we continue to move forward, that's where you're going to see a lot of that um, so that, that's price increasing, if you will, but it's really a product mix shift to higher price products. Um, you have that within pricing for the market and for us, you know, it's, gonna, it's, it's looking low single digits um, in that 2 to 3% range I talked about, probably more towards the upper end of that. Um, and that's, you know, kind of where the industry is residing right now and where we're sitting. All right, thanks for the caller. And then just one other question. I think you, you had a really interesting comment, but it was pretty brief on the idea of introducing some new digital tools to help facilitate my site um, and streamlining the fitting process a little bit, um, yep. which seems like it might, it might be a little bit of a friction that you know, could, be, could be helped with, with these kind of initiatives. So just maybe like expand a little bit what you're doing there and, and how it could help that process. Thanks a lot for taking the sure. questions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, one of the challenges that uh, optometrists have with my site is they bring the child in, they have to talk to the child, they have to uh, explain what contact lenses are, how to put lenses in, take lenses out. They got to explain to the parent what myopia is and the progression of myopia. The process takes a little while, and uh, when you layer contact lenses into it, it makes it a little bit more difficult than glasses. Um, so anything that we can do to uh, improve that process and make it faster uh, is going to be definitely beneficial. And our marketing team has done a really nice job there and the development team on streamlining some of that activity to ensure that optometrists uh, understand the fitting process and are able to do it very quickly. I won't get into necessarily the technical attributes and so forth of what we're doing, uh, but suffice it to say, yeah, anything that we can do to streamline that and help make that process easier and faster, the better. So, uh, yeah, you picked up on that. It's a good point because that is a benefit and it's going to help us continue to drive growth. Our next question comes on the line of John Block with Stipple. Please go ahead. Thanks, guys. Um, I'll try to be somewhat brief. Two quick ones. First on Paragard, I don't know. I just feel like the talk track has seemingly improved maybe from three months ago. You know, nothing's really changed from a regulation standpoint. Al, am I right? Is there anything behind that where, again, you had a decent beat in the quarter. You talked about a pretty good start in fiscal 2Q. It just seems a little less dire, uh, if correct. Is there something more to it? Um, I think with respect to Paragard, uh, it, that's going to be a little bumpy. Um, the underlying demand is still a struggle there in terms of uh, being able to grow volumes. And then the other aspect of that ends up being a uh, competitive product. We've talked about that before. There was a product that could potentially get FDA approval that's uh, essentially a generic. That If that does get approved and hit the market, that would impact us. Um, you know, when we gave guidance back in December, we incorporated some of that. That product has not been approved. Um, so if you look at it as we move through the year, that makes me, yes, a little bit more optimistic for better performance uh, this year. Okay. And second, uh, quick one, just within CVI, just cleaning up a little bit, you know, the, the overall 7%, I think, was in line with, with estimates. You guys sort of signaled that. But from our seat, EM, EMEA was decently ahead, APAC below, and anything to call out specific to APAC, because when I look at the year-ago comp, it was actually one of the easier ones from fiscal 23. I, I don't know if that's where we sort of go from a capacity standpoint, but maybe if you could just um, elaborate on that. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, not too much to say on that other than I think um, it got picked up a little bit about uh, some communication we had in Japan with respect to some capacity constraints. So when you look at uh, allocation of product and capacity constraints that we had, um, that negatively impacted Asia Pack and probably will, frankly, a little bit again here in, in uh, the second quarter. But uh, um, the underlying fundamentals and the team and the success we're having in, in Asia Pack is still strong. I think there's just a little bit on the capacity constraint side of things is what you're picking up. Thanks, guys. 
Next question comes from the line of E.C. Kirby with Redburn Atlantic. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, we'll just stick to one. I mean, obviously, you have your hands full with my day and, and the strength of that product, but I would love to know how you're thinking about, um, you know, potential new innovation within the vision care space, uh, potential new product launches. I think it's been, you know, close to 10 years now since we saw um, my day first hit the market. So I guess what, what is next? Um, how are you thinking about new launches? And to what extent does capacity right now hinder your ability to introduce uh, perhaps a new lens family? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, if we look at my day as an example, uh, I think the multifocal just came out a couple of years ago. Um, My Day Energist, as an example, just came out roughly a year ago in the U.S. market. So we still need to roll the multifocal out around the world. Uh, frankly, there's still areas we need to get the torque out more, uh, the expanded parameter range. There's markets we need to get My Day Energist into. Uh, so you're, you're just going to continue to see for the coming years a, a bunch of launch activity, but it'll be associated mostly with products that you've already heard of. Okay, and then just a quick follow-up, if I may, just on daily penetration. I mean, we've talked a lot about the runway in Torek, but really, I guess, what's the runway left in daily Torek? Just in terms of units, where do you see it currently sitting, I guess, for 2023? Um, where do you think the ceiling really is for, for dailies in terms of units? Yeah, it, it's tough in terms of units because there's so many units um, when somebody's wearing dailies, right? Because if they go from like BioAffinity for us, they need 24 lenses a year. And depending upon how often they're wearing their dailies, right, 700 and some lenses a year. Um, so it's tough. But I, I would tell you, if you looked at a comparison of – the FRP market, the two-week and monthly market, and said that's where dailies is going to get ultimately, um, that was that kind of without getting into all the gory details, would tell you that uh, you just have a very significant runway in terms of, of dailies and wearers. So um, that's where I go back to like saying, hey, the market's a great market for 10 years or something like that because it, it's so underpenetrated on the daily side. Okay. No, sorry. I think I think I meant users in my question, but yeah. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. No further questions at this time. I'll now turn the call over to Al White, President CEO. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone for taking the time and joining the call. Uh, as you can probably tell from uh, uh, our commentary and responsive questions, we're excited about where we are now. Uh, we started the year off really well. We're in a really good position at, uh, moving forward. So um, uh, thanks again and uh, really look forward to our catching, effort, uh, catching up with everyone on our next earnings call. Thank you, operator. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.